Right, hello everyone. We're here to talk about John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism. And specifically, I'll be talking a little bit about the background to Mill, and I'm going to be recommending an excellent podcast to you. I'm going to be looking at Mill's proof of utilitarianism, which is very interesting. You know, as we do that, we will cover a number of criticisms of Mill's proof, most notably from G.E. Moore. And then we'll end by looking at some of the meta-ethical implications of Mill's proof. So to start off thinking about uh, four of the differences between J.S. Mill and Bentham, I won't be covering those, but that's something that you need to know for your examination. And here is the podcast that I very much recommend of what sort of proof the principle of utility is susceptible. So you can listen to Mill's own words and it's fantastically read to you. So I that's highly recommended. Now, moving on to the actual, um, the actual theory itself, the proof itself. So I'm going to be using uh, Michael Lacewing's resources very much here. I recommend that you have a look at his textbook, uh, Philosophy for AS and A-Level Epistemology and Moral Philosophy. And I'm going to accompany this uh, screencast with a, a summary from his textbook. So beginning with stage one that happiness is good. Mill says that you can't prove that something is good or not, but you can give a very reasoned argument around it. And he argues that this is very normal for first principles, that you cannot deduce first principles. What is good is what we should aim at in all of our actions. So good is an end. It's the purpose of our action. Happiness is the purpose of our actions, so he argues. So if good is an end, what is good is what we should aim at in our lives. It is the purpose of our actions, and it's what we should aim at as well. So it's a normative claim. So what he wants us to show is, first, that happiness is desirable. And secondly, and more controversially, that only happiness is desirable. So moving on then, desire and happiness. Since we can't deduce what is good, we have to appeal to evidence, as is common, as I said, with all first principle claims. The only proof capable of being given that an object is visible, this is what Moore, uh, Mill argues, is that people can actually see it. So this is an argument by analogy. We can only know that we see something because people actually see it. In like manner, the sole evidence that something is desirable is that people desire it. So Mill feels the evidence that happiness is desirable is simply the fact that people desire happiness. So therefore, no reason can be given why the general happiness is desirable, except that each person desires his own happiness or her own happiness. Now, is this the fallacy of equivocation? Well, G. E. Moore says that it is, and his argument is that um, equivocation, as we know, is when you use one word with two different meanings, and you conflate these two different meanings. According to uh, G. E. Moore, uh, Mill commits this fallacy, and it makes his argument, his proof, in, uh, invalid. So Mill says that, um, Moore says that Mill equivocates on the term desirable, and he conflates the two different meanings. The first of them is that desirable means something is worthy of being desired, that it is a good, and he equivocates and conflates the other meaning of desirable, which means capable of being desired, what people uh, desire. So is this actually a valid um, charge? Well, the reply would be what people desire is evidence for what is desirable. And what Miller is simply arguing is that everyone wants happiness. So it's reasonable to infer that happiness is good. So really, um, Lacewing and many other philosophers feel that Moore's charge is not a legitimate one.
This is a very interesting claim. This, however, being the fact, we have not only all the proof the case admits of, but all of which is possible to require that happiness is a good, that each person's happiness is a good to that person, and the general happiness, therefore, is a good to the aggregate of all people. So here's the claim. If the individual uh, seeks happiness, therefore the general happiness is sought by the aggregate of all people. So this is the movement from the individual to the general in Mill's proof. Now, again, he's criticized here with another fallacy. This time, it is the fallacy of composition. And the fallacy of con uh, composition is attributing some feature of the members of a collection to the collection itself. Because each person desires their own happiness, everybody desires their own happiness, the general happiness. So is this an example of the fallacy of uh, composition? Well, have a look at this example to our left here. Compare this. Every girl loves a sailor. Therefore, there is one sailor who every girl loves. Clearly not. And that would be the fallacy of composition, wouldn't it? Attributing the singular to the group. The reply to this charge that Mill commits the fallacy of composition is that Mill simply assumes impartiality. It's not the same as the analogy above. If happiness is good, then morality concerns the general happiness. So the charge of the fallacy of composition there doesn't seem to stick. Now, stage two of Mill's proof is far more controversial and much more interesting. It's that people don't only desire happiness. And his reply is, happiness has many ingredients, such as truth and freedom, and each ingredient is desirable in itself. So those people who would say, actually, look, people desire a great deal more than only, only happiness. Um, Mill's reply is actually that these other ingredients are just constitutive. And this is the distinction between external means and, and constitutive means. To want to know the truth for its own sake is the same as one's happiness consisting in knowing the truth. It's not possible to desire something that you don't think of as a pleasure. And that's a very important and controversial point there. It is not possible to desire something that you don't think is a pleasure. Now, we'll see later towards the end of this presentation that that really does bring up the charge that Mill's thinking is reductive naturalism. This diagram taken again from Blaiswing's textbook um, shows the idea that we have happiness on the outside here. And then these are the constitutive elements of happiness, such as truth, freedom, friendship, beauty, etc. It's a very different conception, I feel, uh, from Aristotle, uh, because the term eudaimonia seems to be a richer term than the notion of simply happiness. And we'll have a look. Some of you will be familiar with, say, Smart's criticism of this conception of happiness. Moving on to SMART, um, there are, of course, objections to this idea of happiness, um, in particular from SMART and from uh, preference utilitarians. Um, both preference utilitarians and SMART provide alternative accounts of happiness and good. Preference utilitarianism allows that if we understand pleasure as a psychological state, we could desire something without desiring it as pleasant. Now, that's the interesting thing. We can desire things which are not pleasant. So that is attacking Mill's uh, second stage of the um, proof of utilitarianism. What we desire is part of our happiness because happiness is the satisfaction of desires, not because happiness is a pleasure which is caused by the satisfaction of desires. So we know that SMART adds an evaluative uh, element to happiness, 
we are made happy by knowing the truth because we approve of knowing the truth and not simply because it brings us pleasure. And if you recall Smart's um, thought experiment of the deluded sadist, this is the thought experiment which he uses to criticize this idea that we would simply pursue happiness at any cost. Now, Lacewing at the end of his um, account of uh, Mill's theory, uh, ask two questions. Explain Mill's argument for the claim that happiness is the only good. Now that's something you should be able to do from this PowerPoint in the description and reading the accompanying notes. And secondly, does Mill succeed in showing that the only good is happiness? Well, that's a very complicated one, an evaluative one. And that's something that we will also be looking at further. Now, what are the implications for meta-ethics? I just want to remind you, um, this is a meta-ethics map taken from uh, page 350 of the Lacewing textbook. And just to remind you of the difference between cognitivism and, and non-cognitivism, cognitivism is the belief that moral judgment express beliefs that can be true or false, that they are truth apt, and non-cognitivism rejects this, and it says that they cannot be true or false. Within cognitivism, as you know, you get moral realism, and moral realism breaks down into moral naturalism and moral non-naturalism. Moral naturalism meaning that uh, moral properties are reducible to natural properties. And we've seen that in Mill's proof, he would conceive of morals as natural pro uh, properties, that they're linked to psychological properties. So he is a form of uh, moral realist, who sees um, ethics as natural properties, okay? Um, just a reminder with moral naturalism then, that moral properties are natural properties, happiness is a natural psychological property, and therefore so is goodness. So he would see goodness as something that you can reach out, that it's tangible, that it's part of the world. So it's an extreme form of moral realism. It's the idea that it is simply like other natural properties that can be found in the world. Goodness and rightness are both natural properties. Now the charge against Mill would be that this is a form of reductive naturalism. Why is this, okay? Well, Mill claims um, at the end of the proof to think of an object as desirable and to think of it as pleasant are one and the same thing. So you're looking at the object and you're saying desirable, pleasant. They are one of the same thing. And this sounds very much like what Bentham said earlier. To say that something is good and to say that it produces happiness is the same thing. So we're talking about analytically the same thing. So if the words good and happiness have the same meaning, Goodness and happiness, therefore, are the same property, just like if we talked about a bachelor and an unmarried man, we would be talking about the same thing, that this comparison would be actually analytically true. Now, many philosophers will attack this conflation of goodness and happiness and will charge that this is a form of reductive naturalism. I hope you found that little summary of Mill's proof um, interesting, um, engaging, and lucid. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the meta-ethical dimension of it and to see how utilitarianism can actually be joined to moral naturalism. Thanks for listening.